we'll get started. My name is Jesse Brandenburg. I work for Intel. And I'm Anjali Singai Jane. I work for Intel as well. Uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, the idea of a single virtual function device driver um, that will be future compatible. So this is kind of a big change for us. We're, we'll, we'll tell you about as of why. Wow, what happened there? Okay. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit today about the, the problem that we see, how we've evolved the, the SRIOV networking, some of our considerations and, and the implementation that we're, that we're working on, and then some of the challenges and the alternative things we might be able to do in the future. Excuse the highlighting on the slides. It seems like a last minute formatting difficulty we ran into. So um, let us know if they're not readable and we'll do another version. The, uh, so in a perfect world, right? Customers today are deploying our hardware devices they have SRIOV support, so they have a, a separate driver for the SRIOV device and, and the physical function, so the PF and the VF. Um, they would like to have uh, backwards compatibility in the VM. So what they want to have done is have a VF uh, driver that stays in their VM image and it stays there forever. And it doesn't have to change and it never breaks and there's no bugs. And, <laughs> right, that this is the perfect world. Um, you know, they want all the advanced features exposed. They want the speed of an SRIOV interface. And uh, any new hardware would always just continue to work. Uh, the other thing that they'd really like is that the low-level software, like the drivers, um, would stay the same so that it can last for multiple generations. So for us, the, the, the destination that we'd like to arrive at is... Um, customers who have many, many, many virtual machines that they have to deploy, like Amazon's cloud, uh, would be able to have many virtual machine images that have the same device driver installed and it doesn't need to be updated. So if they get new hardware, because hardware doesn't last forever, they get new hardware, they don't have to spin all their VF images, all their VM images, in order to update their device driver for the SROV device. So this idea would stretch us today because many, and I think many of the other vendors, because the device drivers are um, changing each release, they're changing each hardware release, and it makes it so that the, uh, the, the vendors have to spin hundreds or thousands of VM images to update their device driver, which is a, a very large overhead, and um, we've heard back in, in no uncertain terms that this is not a, variable, not a very acceptable scenario. So the other thing is uh, we want feature compatibility, right? So like I said, replace hardware. The, the, the instructions here from our customers is don't change the VF driver unless you really, really, really have to. So going back to a little bit of history for us, the, the evolution of SRIOV enabled network device drivers. We started back in time with the IGB VF driver. It provided a, you know, kind of a basic connectivity um, not very many queues, not very, very many uh, interrupt vectors, and it was on a one gig part. Later, we went to the IXGB EVF driver. Um, it evolved some. The, it had improved performance. It had a better e-switch, like the Mellanox guys were just talking about. Uh, it had um, load balancing, and it had multi-queue support. And then the current generation that we have is the I40 EVF driver. Today, that driver is... Um, a, a VF driver that looks a lot like a PF driver in terms of its features and support, and it, you know, it, it could even grow uh, further if we wanted it to. It has supports, some, you know, up to eight queues, uh, uh, multiple interrupt vectors, etc. So, all of these devices, all supported TX and RX checksum offloads, they give you the hardware support that you need to go fast in an SROV device. Now okay. my colleague Anjali will take over. So going back to this. So we have already in the kernel three different VF drivers for SRV devices. 
And this has been in the last six years, I believe. Like we started in 2009, and by 2014 or 15, we had three, three drivers. And this is because we had three generations of SRE supported uh, NICs. And going by the trend, we will be producing every two years a new VF driver, right? So that doesn't look really good to our customers, and that's the problem we want to fix. That this all hopefully gets combined into a single VF driver, which is backward and forward compatible, but at the same time, it can expand to expose all the you know, good qualities of uh, uh, you know, filtering and uh, 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 performance improvements and all the stuff that all was talking about, that all the benefits that we get from SRV, but also uh, from a, a real uh, switch level programming of um, uh, forwarding um, rules, et cetera. So um, we looked at what we got right now and we looked at what is something that we can preserve in the future that will give us the fast path um, uh, you know, for the packets uh, going not south or east-west, but whatever else needs to happen to configure that SRV uh, device um, may not be something that remain constant right, over generations. So, so we, we looked at the lowest common denominator of what seems to stick and can be expanded in the future. Um, but the other things that are necessary to configure the device and that can be done on a control plane. And so we come up, we came up with a, uh, uh, the, the, some set of features that are uh, you know, to be preserved over the generations and we call it the base mode features. And then um, uh, built upon that uh, something uh, we, we are calling it the adaptive virtual function. Uh, and this is something um, we, will basis, be, we will be basing it on I4D VF driver and uh, most likely rebranding it for our future devices. Um, you know, I kind of listed down the base features that um, we would be preserving, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, single level checksum and TSO offloads, the multi-queue support, RSS, uh, things like that. Uh, so um, what does it mean to preserve uh, some kind of base mode compatibility going forward in hardware and software? Uh, what that means is um, having a fixed register definitions in the hardware for some limited range of registers um, uh, that uh, define the base mode. Uh, having um, a fixed metadata format for DMA, this is the descriptor definitions for transmit and receive. Um, having uh, some kind of a generic uh, mailbox uh, which can uh, work between the virtual function driver and the physical function driver so that uh, whatever else that the VF driver needs to configure, it can do it through the PF driver in a generic fashion. Um, on the software side, what you need is uh, some kind of a virtual channel on top of the generic mailbox, which can be expanded for um, functionality. Okay, so, um, and, and the other thing that we could um, leave room for in hardware and software, uh, so that the VF driver that uh, we're calling the adaptive VF driver is truly adaptive in the sense that it can grow to take benefit of the next generation um, of products and not just limited to the base mode functionality. Um, uh, so for that, you would have to kind of um, make sure there's enough room to grow, both in terms of the number of queues that the device will support on, on, a, v, on a VF function or, and, and the number of interrupts. So um, in the hardware definitions, leave room to grow in that space. And uh, define the virtual function, uh, virtual channel on the on the mailbox in a way that it can um, expand to grow more and more, um, negotiate more features with the PF. Okay, and this uh, highlighting is really bugging, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is a simple, uh, you know, 
picture kind of demonstrating what we're trying to achieve. Uh, there are two, three different generations of uh, Intel NICs uh, down there with uh, running three different PF drivers in the hypervisor, um, but all of them supporting um, the same, uh, supported by the same virtual function driver in the VMs. Um, okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, so th this, is the, uh, this is the idea that we never have to have a different um, virtual function driver ever again. Okay, this um, slide kind of um, um, goes over the design pattern uh, that we, were, uh, we based our AVF on. Um, so we will have a single device ID for all SIV devices going forward. Um, we'll preserve uh, some base definition in the hardware, make the VF driver a dependent driver and not an independent driver. And this is something that all was talking again, that it should be com controlled from the VF representer rather than it controlling itself. And, and this goes really well with what we are doing here, is if this VF driver is a dependent driver, it ac actually doesn't make any decisions for itself, but it lets the control plane, which is in the hypervisor, to decide what uh, traffic ends up in the VF driver or what it can send. So. Yeah, so, so separate out the data and control plane. Um, and um, uh, leave room for uh, you know, negotiation of advanced features uh, that are um, proxied through the PF driver. Okay, some, uh, some more on the implementation uh, detail. Uh, uh, once we have a common uh, dri uh, VF driver across multiple generations, uh, we, we have to preserve the base registers and DMA metadata formats uh, in each generation of the silicon. So we kind of uh, publish that set, and um, every um, device going forward has to honor that. Um, and uh, it, the same goes for the software virtual channel that we define for communication between the PF and VF. It will have to be published and preserved so that we can talk in the same language between the PF and VF driver. Some more on the base features. Um, uh, what we're doing is uh, identifying, um, you know, uh, at present, say the I-40 VF driver supports four queues, um, you know, that needs to be preserved, but at the same time, re leave room for expansion um, uh, in, the, in the register set. Um, same goes for the receive queues, MSIX vectors. Um, uh, I-40 and IGBF, all of them support RSS uh, for multi-queue uh, load balancing um, functionality, and that is a base feature that will be preserved. Um, uh, uh, you know, checksum, TSO, um, hash for GRO, all that stuff is base feature and should be preserved. Um, uh, and, you know, so this is pretty much um, the, uh, you know, total definition of what we call the base features um, in terms of, uh, you know, hardware capabilities. Uh, so what are the extended features that, um, uh, you know, the I-40VF and, and actually BBF support right now? Um, uh, they support, um, you know, VLAN trunking, promiscuous mode uh, enabling for SRV devices, uh, encapsulation offloads. Um, uh, they have uh, ways to program filters in the hardware. Um, uh, I-40 supports uh, RDMA um, uh, client drivers as well. Um, and, you know, there are a whole bunch of features that have been added in the present generation we have devices to uh, make them more useful in the NFV use case. So this all is not part of base features, but it remains, since this is an adaptive VF driver, it will still remain as part of I-40 VF, but the way it will be done 
would be dependent on the underlying PF device, uh, underlying device, right? So there's no specific limit to what a VF device can do in hardware in the upcoming devices. It is in terms of you know resource and capabilities and you know throughput and latency what what not it is just like a pf device um, but what we are trying to achieve here is um, we want to have a single control plane for all the pf and vf dri drivers and it should be in the hypervisor instead of vf having its own control plane uh, what are the challenges in having a single vf driver uh, for all devices. Um, uh, since um, uh, an in-kernel driver is not a static thing, uh, there are patches added, there are functionalities enabled, and it keeps growing, it would, be, it would be quite a challenge to make sure we are not breaking the base functionality, and it can still work with limited feature set on the future devices. Um, it does increase the validation matrix quite a bit for us, where when we are adding new features into the VF driver, we have to now test it on all the supported devices, which are, um, you know, from different, um, they have different IPs underneath and stuff like that. So having separate drivers did help us in the validation, um, uh, you know, uh, reducing the validation matrix quite a bit, where um, when you change i 40 VF, you don't really have to test it on uh, Niantic or anything like that. But, you know, this will enforce that anything that supports the base mode, it has to be tested on all those devices. Um, uh, and every patch can potentially break the AVF model and make assumptions about underlying devices and capabilities. So we re this is, this is the, the most challenging part with respect to base mode. You know, defining the base functionality in the hardware wasn't that hard, or you know, coming up with what uh, the software design should be uh, to make this possible, it wasn't the hard part. But I think this is where we will be spending a lot of time keeping it that way. Okay, so uh, you know, Jesse went over what was the problem definition, and this kind of summarizes what will be the user experience once we have a single VF driver. Um, uh, so the idea here is if you were to pick uh, kernel X and you know, the driver, if it had a VF driver which was uh, AVF certified driver, it will still run 10 years from now uh, and will run on the latest device that Intel releases, right? Um, although if you were to take the latest AVF driver from the latest kernel at that time, you will get more functionality. But still, you will still get basic connectivity with any old AVF driver. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much um, is what the users want. We also um, had some other you know, considerations into uh, should we be considering offloading word I.O. Like, so a word I.O. into, you know, there's already a word I.O. driver. Could we make Intel devices have word I.O. offload on it? Um, and instead of coming up with this ABF uh, that we came up with, um, uh, there are some challenges there. The way the word I.O. Um, uh, rearings and are, are defined and they're not very offload friendly is how we look at it. Uh, there are too many indirections uh, and pointers going. When you say offload VOTO, what do you mean? Uh, the DM engine. Uh, so instead of having an emulated device that what IO runs on, you could hook it up to a real device. So instead of. But VOTO uh, needs front end and back end. So, the, uh, so I, I mean, if I had the front end or what IO driver running, could I still back it up with an SRV device? That's what I mean. So, so then I don't have to provide my, um, you know, VF driver. What I owe is backed by an SRV device. Uh, you, you want Vue.io to serve as your front end if you're a virtual function? Yes. And so, um, uh, you know, okay. there is some uh, looking into it. 
definitely that we could do. And if we are going through the what I 1.1 spec, um, we may want to consider the option where it gets the benefit of SRAV uh, backed interfaces. Um, uh, this could be a separate discussion, but you know we just want to kind of bring it up that we did consider what is the solution? Why do users who are asking for a single VF driver uh, want it? And I think they like the Vertile style uh, interfaces, which are generic enough. So, um, also, because everything is going to be eBPF now, can't you just store the eBPF block for the driver on the hardware? Uh, there is considerations for that. Okay. Um, and, and okay. Right, go ahead. Um, what is a future work for us? Publishing a standard specification for an AVF device. What that also means is it, once we have this host interface published for an AVF device, some other vendor could actually have a, their own device that supports um, that, that can um, use AVF as their driver, right? So it's almost like we are defining a specification for a device for this driver. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the past, one of the biggest issues between having separate drivers was that we had code duplication. Tons yes. of it. Yeah. And so that when there was a patch for the PF, there was a patch for the VF. Yes. Or there wasn't. Or there wasn't, in which case <laughs> the VF was broken. Or um, how is the single driver model going to reduce or fix this code duplication? Because I can still see going forward that we're going to have, oh, if we have a patch for the PF, we're going to have to have a patch for this model, you know, this single VF driver. So do you want me so, to answer that? Good. So from, from our perspective, the process right now doesn't have to change for anything going upstream. The, the upstream development process doesn't change or slow down in, in any way. The, the driver keeps advancing. The cool part is, is that um, the 2017 VF driver that was locked into a VM image in 2017 will still run on a 2019 hardware part that comes out in 2019. So you have this old VF driver and it will just work with uh, new hardware and a new PF that it's never seen before, right? We'll have tested it hopefully, um, of course, but the idea is is that you get that future compatibility. So the kernel keeps advancing, right? 4.11 4 kernel has a new I-40 EVF driver, 4.12 has a new I-40 EVF driver with more patches in it. Um, the problem that you have is not addressed by this model at all. The problem that you mentioned is not addressed by this model at all, right? We're talking, but it definitely should be addressed. <laughs> We, we would like to make it so that the two were split. There's a reason that, that that's happening upstream, but it's not really relevant um, to, to the community. It's more of a development process thing for us. Right. Um, actually, one thought I have, it's kind of the inverse of what Jeff was just issuing uh, or asking about. <clears throat> At what point do you quit adding new devices to an existing driver? Like, if, if you will, imagine if we had never forked E1000 and everything Going all the way back, all ran on E1000, you know. At what point do we stop adding backwards compatibility just for the sake of maintainability of the driver? Or are we going to somehow find a different way to split off things so that we can lock the base mode driver while still having new drivers for the advanced functionality we're adding? Uh, yeah, so we did consider this uh, option as well where we could have two uh, drivers. Whereas, you know, there's, what's that? Hmm. Uh, two drivers, one is a frozen uh, a base mode driver, which just does that limited thing and runs on every single device. But we always have another backup driver, which is an extended features driver. Uh, in terms of maintenance, it is no, e it, it, that, that is not an easy solution either, right? And, and it's not a great user experience where if I have already, uh, you know, installed my kernel and, you know, pick the driver and then, you know, if I wanted an extended feature, I have to actually rebuild or do something. The, the, the user experience should be transparent when they're going from base feature to an advanced feature. 
that it should all be handled in the same driver. I mean, that's the conclusion we came up with. Well, right, but my concern, <clears throat> concern is it might end up going the other way. What you end up with is after a while, you've added, you know, your, let's say we get up to the point of terabit, you know, 10 years from now, you know, you're adding your terabit driver, but in the process, your existing base for your 40 gig drivers now, who nobody uses anymore, suddenly, you know, you've got a bunch of customers that are coming up because their stuff doesn't work anymore because you went and added new code without validating that, the old. That, that is the point we brought about, that the critical point uh, is we, the, the biggest challenge we have is making sure it works on all those old devices as well, right? Um, I, Alex, I think part of, the, part of the intention here is, is that the domain- Mike, please. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I, I think one of the things that, that is important about doing it specifically for this is that the domain space is smaller. Well, see, that's the thing, though, is like a couple slides back. A couple slides back, they are pointing out they're going to have the option of extending these drivers so that they support, what was it, you had RDMA and several other different features listed. So there, the there is expandability, ADF. but that's not part of the base feature set. So, it, so it, a PF driver could limit the VF from having any of those features. Well, right, the PF can limit the VF, but see, the problem is, my concern is I just would prefer to have us see it, uh, see it through such that we have one base mode VF, like with a two-tuple ID, and then a separate driver for your advanced features that are under like a four-tuple ID. So you could split the two up somehow, um, just so you don't end up with one uh, driver that ends up with a bunch of feature creep and uh, maintainability issues for the base mode, when we probably should be forking it so that we have a advanced features driver and a base features driver. Yeah, we actually thought through this a lot, right? We discussed this a bunch, um, and and what we decided, and after talking with our validation, is that either way you end up having to test both the same amount, right? You're really not earning yourself anything, um, at reducing the effort or reducing the creep. Um, like we said, the 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 biggest uh, chunk of um, work is that you have to go back and do regression testing, right? On on these older, let's say like, you know, the driver that came out in some distro in 2017, right? Or 2018, you gotta make sure that driver still works on your new uh, PF and hardware that, that you're shipping, right? So we, we do add a bunch of regression testing and I think that's one of the issues that, that, she, that she was gonna talk about on this slide, right? Is, the, uh, is that we want to um, make automated regression much easier than it is today by, by doing some tricks. And that's one thing we wanted to bring up here for a discussion point is how do you enable um, better testing of, for instance, these older devices, right? How do you force the device into base mode? Should we use a, do you want me to mention this now? Sure. Do you want me, you know, should we use a k-config option that lets you compile a driver that does like a reverse negotiation It always negotiates to the lowest, right? It forces the PF to advertise the lowest capability right, out, out of the box so that you can test the base mode VF easily on some older VM image that you have. This is a problem, right, because normally you wouldn't ever want that from, the, from this i40 EVF driver, right, or the, the PF driver. It would advertise, you can have whatever you like, right, or you can have whatever I can give you um, that works. So, yeah, we, we didn't really like the idea either of doing two separate drivers with support for the same device ID because then you get into the which driver loads first problem. And there is the kernel module load order thing, but it gets ugly really fast and really hard to explain to users and, and why still, they need this other driver. <laughs> right, and you still have to validate that base driver on the new device. I mean, it doesn't really solve the problem. So, in fact, like the validation matrix would increase with you know two drivers there rather than a single driver. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what we had, um, and. Uh, that's the model we are going with, keeping it simple. Um, you know, uh, reduce uh, you know the direct uh, uh, memory footprint in the VF to just just the hot you know the hot path, and everything else is negotiated through the through the PF driver over the word channel, and um, that hopefully will give us um, you know. A, a, you know, device driver model that lasts for many generations. So, am I understanding it right that if you upgrade your part, 
you have the base feature set and the advanced feature set, and only the base feature set is guaranteed to be future compatible. So you could upgrade a physical NIC device, and then the, the AVF driver in the guest might see fewer features. Yeah, I mean, it might see yes. a future feature, uh, fewer features on an older AVF driver, but if you were to go get the latest AVF driver, you know, you might still get all the extended features on right, that device. Right, but the whole point of this was that you never have to upgrade that AVF driver in your fixed guest from the old days of 2017. No, you, wouldn't have, you wouldn't have to break it. You right? won't, you yeah. <laughs> right, so I mean, what's happening right now is like, when we put out a new device, you either do not have a VF driver that can run it on it, or there is some delay. And any of the VMs that you might have created five years with a VF driver in it will not work on the new device, right? So we are solving only the basic connectivity problem going forward. If you want the extended features, you still will have to get the latest AVF driver, right? So there is a risk that if you upgrade the hardware on the host, the guests may see a reduction in feature set. Yes. But yep. This is better than having no virtual. Right, right. I just yeah. Right, yeah. So, so yeah, it. if it gives the vendor a chance to slowly upgrade all their VM images if they wish to get the new features, right? It's kind of a, it's, it's not an either or deal. It's a, you can move one from one working scenario to a better working scenario. Um, yeah, the, the, you know, this, this hardware definition that we've set is kind of, we, we pared down what's, what do we think the minimum useful thing is for a VF instance? And that's what this base mode is about. And, you know, honestly, if you have a programmable NIC or an FPGA based NIC or something, you could probably write a hardware interface to this definition and advertise the device ID and our VF driver will load on it and run, right? right? You, you can, you could do that and any vendor could do that. And other OSs could do that. So think about this. It enables a bunch of people to all of a sudden write this driver once for I don't know, some random OS like an embedded or an IoT or whatever you want, uh, you know, kind of scenario, some other non Linuxy thing or maybe some tiny Linuxy thing and have it stay and have it work for a long period of time. Um, it also hopefully reduces the, you know, the, the bug creep of, uh, <laughs> you know, an older VF driver if it has to fall back to base mode. The PF can turn off features if it doesn't work or if you don't want it. So you could, we don't have an interface for it today, but you could tell the PF, you know, don't let this VF have X, Y, and Z feature, right? It's asking the PF for everything, right? It's asking the PF, can I do this? Can I do that? Um, so that, that's, we kind of, you know, paired off the interface to what, what was necessary and what was um, optional. Thank you. So I completely see where you're going uh, with this, and it makes sense. Uh, I do have to say one thing, and you already touched, about, uh, touched it a little bit, is that when you go to customer, yes, they're, they're bugged by the, the fact that they need to replace driver if they replace cards and so on, but the same customers, sadly, for hardware vendors like the one I work for, for example, they're also bugged by the fact that they need to replace driver if they replace uh, NIC vendors, right? So something really cool we might be able to do is if we define this thing, but not necessarily just for Intel NIC, but as some sort of a standard, minimal functionality, but working VF driver across the board, uh, I think for our customers that will be something very useful. I don't know if you guys are open for this, but I know our customers will. So yeah, right, right. so that's the great, I mean, that's the point, right? So we will have two ways of looking at it. One is once we publish an AVF device spec, any vendor could adapt it, and we all have a common driver, so it's vendor agnostic, or we evolve Vortio in such a way that it is, uh, it can get the benefits of SRV, right? So those are the two options here. Uh, you wanted to add something, Jesse? No, I was saying this is just our this is our effort at starting that that point, and we actually don't object to, at all to anybody coming along and implementing this interface, right? If they wanted to, it's it's a simple enough interface. It's really pretty tiny. Right. Um, the the tricky part is the descriptor, right? It has to kind of stay the same because the driver expects a particular layout of the ring and the way the descriptors work. Right. Um, and it's of course targeted at our hardware because we wanted to make it work on our stuff to begin with. But you know, like I said, if you have a versatile part and you can program it to export this interface, then it'll just work, should just work. Right, I mean, 
we are open to collaboration if we you know want to define something that is vendor agnostic and we can preserve it so so you, you say that vertio one or one dot one is not an, uh, is a tough option because of the variance um, but have you considered any kind of vertio two dot o or something new because each hypervisor has their own vinix so we are already facing these issues today. So why not coming with a, a software model that will fit some hardware models? And maybe let's forget the VirtaU as it is today, but something new that will be usable for software backend as well as for hardware backends. Right. Um, so there is there are some folks at Intel who are trying to pursue that option that can we define what are 2.0 or 1.1, whatever you call it. The next specifications for VirtaU, which kind of gives us the option of uh, having a real IO device behind it, an SRV back device. So we get the benefit of SRV throughput, but at the vendor agnostic uh, uh, quality of uh, what IO as well, right? So that's a consideration as well. And if, uh, you know, whoever is working on the next spec for what IO, we would be really happy to work with them to, um, you know, make that change. Yeah.